Hello, natures and friends. Welcome to episode eleven of the Seedling Stage Knitting Podcast. I'm your host Athena, and I am a knitter based in Vancouver, Canada. I'm also a knitting teacher at my local yarn store, Wet Coast Wools, and I'm working towards a knitwear designer. Apart from that, I'm also a PhD student in mechanical engineering, and in fact, I just had a academic paper published last week. I'll put it here in case if you're interested in fluid mechanics, but if not, let's talk about knitting. This channel is my creativity outlet, where I share some of my experiences and thoughts on knitwear design and modification, and hopefully give you some useful tips and tricks. And thank you for taking your time to knit with me or just to watch me rambling. And today I have two finished objects and some random small whips and a lot of making plans to go through. Uh, so without further ado, please grab your knitting or your drinks, hot and cold, and some snacks, and let's start it with today's episode. So if you come from my previous episode, I have showed my knitted animal friends Charlotte, and she's so cute. But uh, she, I made Charlotte for my friend who's getting married in late this year back in China. So I have shipped Charlotte away. So bon voyage, Charlotte. But I think a lot of you are super interested in animal knitting now because you watched my cute Charlotte and are interested in、uh, having an animal knit along. Uh, I'm. I have counted the yarn that I left for knitting animals, and、um, there's probably not enough to knit a big one from the book "Knitted Animal Friends" by Louise Crowther. But、uh, there should be enough to make some smaller, like 20 centimeter animals. I have recommended some patterns for animal doll knitting on Ravelry in my previous episode, and there are a few like bears, bunnies. And deers that I want to knit that are all of the smaller sizes, and I think I should be having enough yarn for them. And I'm thinking to make an animal knit along maybe in October ish because I have some projects that I need to finish by September, and I also have a thesis to write for my PhD. So I'll be super busy for the next two months. But starting from October, I think maybe we could do an animal knit along. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And for today's、uh, first finished object, and also what I'm wearing, I am wearing the June Top Light by Petite Knit. But I've done a lot of modifications on it. Let me do a finished object dance for you. La 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 la. <laughs> The pattern came out in June because the June top light.、Uh, she had two versions: a June top made with DK weight yarn, and this June top light made with、uh, a fingering weight yarn and 2.5 millimeter needles. And it, although it's a small piece of knitwear, but due to the fine gauge, it does took a long time to knit. I used this yarn. Uh, from China,、uh, from the brand Hui Guixian or Love Yarn. It is a China hemp and cotton blend and、uh, sort of fingering weight, so it's quite suitable for this project. And I don't have enough yarn in a single color to make this, so、uh, I striped it with the white and the this is a navy dark navy blueish color into this. And I talk in my previous episode that I chose.、Uh, I did 16 rows of the white and 10 rows of the navy blue, so that the white and blue could have a ratio at 1.6. That is close to the golden ratio in mathematics, and the. Everything designed with golden ratio is supposed to be pleasing to the eyes of people.、Uh, so, yeah. 
I'm not sure if you look at it, maybe like this ratio is perhaps better than the um, like one to one ratio stripes. And I think I, I do like uh, like I think I do like this ratio of the white and dark navy blue combination. And apart from that, another modification I did was to add these lacy patterns on the bottom three stripes on the white. And this uh, lace pattern is from the Japanese lace pattern 280. I have the Chinese version, but uh, you can buy this in English as well. And I used the wave lace pattern 204 in this book. 204. And I just like put this pattern into these white strips. And I think this wave pattern sort of goes well with this navy sort of theme. So um, yeah, I think it looks well. And I only did three uh, stripes because above that is going to be at my like chest breast region and I don't want any holes in it and that's my modification number two and for my modification number three from the original pattern is uh, I, I shortened the whole thing so this pattern is knitted from bottom up and you cast on from the bottom and knit in the round until at here you will separate it into the front and back panel and then uh, knit in the flat and when you knit towards like this area you will uh, divide the front into the left shoulder and the right shoulder and then knit in the flat as well and you do the same thing for the back and then until you knit to the shoulder strap and you will Kitchener stitch the front and the back of the shoulder strap and after that you will do the I cord bind off on uh, the bottom and this neckline and the two armholes so that's the construction of this uh, of this top and according to the pattern this uh, bottom like knitting in the round part should be a lot longer so the original pattern have you to knit it longer and about to the like the hip bone but i think for for me like i i like the top to be sort of cropped and i like this to be in my uh, waist it it ends at my waist area and so i knitted like 10 centimeter shorter than the prescribed length from the pattern and I like it and I usually wear high waist uh, pants in summer so I'm okay with my waist area not being covered by my top in and instead covered by my pants so I think this crop length works well for me there was a modification number four that I failed and I'm going to talk about it. Uh, so I shortened the length of the bottom and when I'm knitting towards the shoulder strap, I think that is sort of too long. When I was knitting, I was also like just sort of fitting it on, uh, like wearing it and to see uh, if I have knitted enough for the shoulder strap. And uh, when I was trying it on, I just sort of feel like I don't need that long of a shoulder strap. So I ended this shoulder strap like 3 or 3.5 centimeter shorter than the prescribed length. So the first version that I finished was like this. And I, at that time, I think I don't want like too much chest area exposed um, just because I don't feel very secure for some reason. So this, so my top was like this and I was trying it on. I think I, it was fine. And I finished doing the eye cord bind off for the armhole, neckline, everything last Friday and I washed and blocked it and and then last night I was showing this off to my grandma each Saturday I do video chat with my grandma it has been like I'm doing a Chinese version of this knitting podcast just for her 
um, because knitting is one of her passion as well. And I'm glad that now I have this common hobby as my grandma, although she couldn't knit anymore due to arthritis. But like it, it's uh, it's been great for us to to bind on the topic of knitting. Well. That's a digression. Anyway, I was showing this off to her and wearing the blocked top and I just feel that this armhole was super tight. It was like just just above my armpit and it doesn't feel very great. And another thing with that I I noticed that this like when when this uh strap was shorter and this the top, the top line of the lacy pattern was sort of just below, just like at the lower area of my breast. And um, my original goal was that I can wear this top sort of as a bralette or a tank top and I don't have to wear a bra separately. But if the holes overlap with my breast and especially if I'm lifting my arm up then the the this hole will be exposing my nipples so I, I don't want that to happen and I just think it would be better if this uh, first line of the lacy pattern should just be below my breast so I decided that I have to extend this shoulder strap and just knit to the length according to the pattern. And I thought last night that it would just be a simple uh, modification to do, uh, but it turns out it's, <laughs> it's, it's a bit messy because I've done the I-cord bind off, right? So I have to unpick the I-cord bind off. I don't need to unpick all the I-cord bind off. I just need to cut the yarn around the like the Kitchener stitch line of the I-cord bind off and unwrap like three or four rows of that uh, I-cord bind off and then I unpick the Kitchener stitch and then I will knit like three centimeters or so until the desired length and then I do the Kitchener stitch again and then I will knit the extra like six centimeter ish of the I-cord so last night I was only able to uh, to finish the like the extra three centimeters of the strap, and this morning I fi I finished the extra I cord bind off for one shoulder strap. So for this shoulder strap, so this is a good one. This is a good one, and for this one I haven't finished the I cord bind off. You can you can see there are still the <laughs> there there are still the yarn tails leaving there. I will have to uh, do this extra like six and six centimeters of I cord bind up uh, for for this, and then I will be one hundred percent finished on this top. But I think I did a good job fixing this. And I only regret that I didn't do the uh, do the length of the shoulder strap as prescribed when uh, just the first time. But the good thing about knitting is that uh, you can always unpick and just knit to the length and just to fit everything to your body. Yeah, so that's a good point of crafting something for yourself. So now after I extended the shoulder strap. I think everything looks fine and now the fitting of the armhole is better. It's just like a cute, nicely fitted, but not too tight, relaxed sort of tank top and I'm very happy with it. Uh, last week the weather has been sort of cool in Vancouver and from yesterday it started to warm up again so I think I can get another week or two weeks of wearing of this tank top before the weather turns into an autumn fall weather. And I forgot to say I knitted the size S uh, just according to the size guide of the pattern I measured my body and then selected the size that fit. And I think usually the in-between knits 
pattern, the size S fit myself pretty well. And size M will give me an oversized, relaxed fit. And for this, it is supposed to be in the negative ease top. So I think it is good. And it has, it has like just enough coverage. Um, it just has the coverage that I am comfortable with, not exposing too much skin area, but it's also very cool. Uh, I am just wearing a, like a simple layered bralette inside with this because like this is still loose and if I accidentally do this I don't want to show uh, show any area that I don't want to show and I still have some of this yarn left I have like over half a ball of the navy blue I have slightly less than a half ball of the white and I have a small amount of the blue from my Provence top of this yarn and I'm just that kind of person that I don't like to have any yarn left. If there's any yarn left, I just want to find a project that can use all of those scrape yarns. So I am not that kind of person who's super interested in buying new yarn. I am that sort of person that just wants to finish using all the yarn that I have and don't have more than what I need. That That's my... Um, philosophy for like owning things so um so i was thinking about project i could do with those yarn so i do like this fabric knitted with the 2.5 millimeter needles and i think it would be great to knit this into just a bra or a bralette and i have looked on ravelry there was a the basic bra by naked knit and I think I'll have enough yarn to knit that, but I also want to make some modifications on that. Uh, the, that pattern is just like a plain, very basic bra, and I'm thinking I could uh, use, I could apply some lace edging pattern for the bra. I have, so I have some like stitch pattern books. This is the other one. Uh, knitting patterns by Hito Mishida, also a Japanese designer. I've shown this book before and I've used this uh, some patterns, some stitch patterns from this book on uh, my other knitwares. And in this book, it gives you a lot of these beautiful edgings. Oh, by the way, this book has an English version as well, and I will put that into the link down below. And I think I could just apply some of the, the edgings in, uh, in the bra. And there was also some more extensive, some more, ex uh, more complicated edging patterns. And I think it would be awesome to apply some of these. Like, look at these. Look at these. I think it would be awesome to apply some of these into uh, like the bottom edging of the bra. So then it's not just the, some something for the inner layer. You can also just wear it outside with some relaxed shirt, that sort of thing. If I have time, I will do that. I, I don't know yet because I have some other more urgent plans that I'm gonna talk about in a second. So that's the June Top Light. And my second finished object is my upcycled project bag. Let me wear it. Oh, let me wear it for you. And this is my own design and I and I am going to release this pattern in the same time, both on Ravelry and my Kofi shop. I will uh, put the, I will put the link in below. And for the first two weeks of release, I will give 20% uh, off of the pattern. So this is a little shoulder drawstring bag, uh, completely m made with knitting techniques with no um, crochet because. I'm not very good at crochet. I'm just getting started with crocheting. So my comfort zone is knitting. I call this 
upcycled project bag because this is upcycled with all the stash yarn I have. These yarn are uh, either from some leftover yarn from my previous sweater projects or some yarn that my grandma gave me, which are leftover yarn from her previous sweater objects from, I don't know, 50 years ago. And the great thing about this project, nicely put by one of you, Helen, is that it can bring back the sweet memory from your previous projects and like now you can count towards one of the stripes and say this is the leftover yarn of me making a sweater or something and then this is the yarn that I left when making some other project and I think this is just a uh, statement piece for you to show off your knitting history or your stash history and I think that's just a really great thing and recycling that's also a good thing to do for environment and uh, in my pattern I gave out some uh, suggestions on how to mix and match your stash yarn so this is knitted with DK weight yarn, meaning that you can use two strands of fingering weight yarn or you can use just the DK weight yarn themselves. Or you can also like if you have lace weight yarn, you can have like two lace weight yarn plus one strand of fingering weight yarn or like one strand of sports weight yarn plus one strand of uh, lace weight yarn to achieve a DK weight. So there's many possibilities for you to combine and use up your stashed yarn. And there's also a color guide. You can uh, mix and match the color tone. Like if you have a warm color, then the next roll, you can go to a cool color. If you are holding two strands together, you can also mix up cool toned color and warm toned color as I did here for this green and the yellow. And also you can uh, play with the combination of brightness. Like if you have a darker colored stripe uh, here, like this dark brown, and then next stripe you could do with some lighter colored as I did here for the gray. So anyway, what I suggest is that if you are doing this sort of like upcycled or recycling project, then you could gather all of the yarn you have and um, pick one. You start with one and then based on the one you've knitted, you can select the next color of yarn that is of an opposite tone or of an opposite uh, brightness or uh, of uh, opposite saturation or you can play with weight or combination. So have fun and be creative. So in the pattern, I also offer different sizes. I didn't grade them by like S, M and L. I just gave a standard size, which is the size that I knitted here. And then I gave out the other sizes as a formula so that whatever size you want to knit, you can calculate and then uh, put the numbers there. Like if you want to knit uh, 20 meters long, uh, 15 centimeter wide and uh, 30 centimeter tall, then you can plug in the numbers in my pattern and find uh, the stitch counts that you need to do for that size of the bag. So the size is totally adjustable. And regarding the construction of the bag, I started with knitting a rectangle piece in the flat and then I pick up stitches around the other three corners as one of you suggested in my last video so instead of uh, casting on and picking up stitches you can also use provisional cast on and uh, so that you don't have to pick up stitches along one of the lines but there aren't uh, many stitches to pick up so just depending on uh, whether you are more comfortable with provisional cast on or if you are more comfortable with picking up stitches you can pick either way you want and after that you will knit in the round until you reach the height that you want for the back and then you will cast off 
uh, five stitches along each of the edges so that you can attach the shoulder strap later on. And then I did a pico folded hem or edge and then I knit this shoulder strap separately. This shoulder strap is just knitting in the round on 10 stitches and then uh, use the matrix stitch to attach to each of the cast off edge. And then I do two I-cord straps. I think in my last video, the only missing part was the I-cord or I haven't done the shoulder strap as well. I don't remember. So. Anyway, you can do some I cord or if you if you don't like I cord, you can also just buy those like shoe laces from from crafting stores and use and use that. But I think the I cord is nice just so that you can have the a uniform style of all the little parts of the bag with this like stockinette sort of appearance. And yeah, and then you can close the bag like this. So I've seen a lot of like bag patterns on uh, Ravelry and most of them are most of them don't really have a like a flat bottom. A lot of bag patterns are more more like the tote bag where you have just have two pieces and then you put graph them together. But I want to have sort of a project bag so that this bag can sit in the flat for me like this. And I and I think like having just a flat knitted bottom for the back would work better. And also, just a secret, I cut a cardboard, <laughs> and then the cardboard of the same size of my the bottom of my bag, and then put it here, just so that it can hold its shape better. And it's really convenient. I've been wearing the bag almost like all the time when I go out now because uh, I can put a small project. This is one of my no frills toe up socks. It's a gift knit for my friend. You can just like put a small project inside and then I put my wallet inside as well. And then I can go. And I can knit anywhere. Like hold this like this, put the yarn ball inside, and then knit on a bus, or knit while I'm waiting for a bus, or even I can knit and I can walk and knit now. But I, but like if I walk very fast, it's um, it's not a very stable knitting, so I don't do that very often. But I can if I want with this little bag. And with the shoulder strap, I don't have to, I don't have to hold anything with my hand, and my both hands are free to do knitting, so that's great. There are, however, some like unsatisfactory part about this bag. Uh, one thing being the shoulder strap. So this is a, just a knitted tube thing. So if I put some heavy thing in the bag, this strap will stretch. Like if I'm just putting a sock knitting project, which is very light, it is, it is fine. But if I'm putting my phone and then my wallet inside, then it will stretch by quite much. And I don't like that. So I've seen from some other bag patterns, you can sew uh, like a, a long piece of fabric inside this, uh, or just some just some fabric or some cable that aren't very stretchy, and you can use that to stabilize the strap. But I haven't learned sewing yet. And speaking of sewing, I would also like to sew an inner lining of my bag just so that these needles won't be like poking out from my bag. But now if I am careful, I can like hide the needles inside my yarn ball and keep them not poking out. But in the future, I do want to learn how to sew. I 
Uh, I happen to see a sewing workshop. There is a sewing workshop uh, on, on my way commute to school. Uh, it's called La Movida, and I've checked out their website. They are offering adult beginner sewing classes. Like they have like a $65 for three hours workshop and uh, it's for like totally beginners and they offer all the materials and sewing machine and I think it would be great if I have time. Uh, I think after, I think it will be one of my PhD thing to do. Like when I'm not bothered with all these thesis writing, dissertation, experiments, simulation, uh, yeah, <laughs> I would, I would learn, I would want to go to that workshop and learn sewing and then I could have a inner lining for the bag and stay tuned for the pattern. When I learn sewing, I will add the sewing instruction to the bag pattern. So that's for the bag. And I have also been working on some other things, but I cannot show you. So I think all of you might have heard of this book, 52 Weeks of Socks by uh, Land Magazine. And recently they have a submission call for a volume two of 52 Weeks of Socks. And in their submission call, um, they say they are welcoming to designers with little or a lot of experiences from different countries, from different cultures, different gender and race. And I, I just think I could do, I could design something for, for this. And I've designed a sock that is based on some uh, ancient Chinese porcelain and I am incredibly proud of my design. I have uh, I have knitted one sample of my design and took some pictures and wrote like a pitch a document and have submitted my design uh, proposal to Land Magazine and they say that they will uh, get back to those designers whose design have been chosen by August 19th. So we'll see by then if they have chose me. Uh, that would be great. And if they haven't, and then I will be self-publishing this design. Um, it's I had great fun designing it, and hope they pick me. And I don't have much work in progress at the moment. I just have some of these socks. Oh, by the way, I'm also teaching a sock knitting class at Wet Coast Wools. I just had my first session yesterday and um, I only had one student, probably because of this weather. It's not the most like knitting centered weather. I, we're supposed to have three students to start this class, but I decided that I still want to do th do this for one student, even with less pay, just to get more practice, um, because this would be my first time teaching a sock knitting class, and it went great. The student she has done, uh, she she had sock knitting experiences before with DPNs and the. Uh, uh, cuff down socks, but uh, in my class I'm teaching uh, I'm teaching her to knit the toe up sock, which is a pattern of my own design, the no frills toe up socks, a free pattern. You can check that out on Ravelry if you wish. And oh, and and there were one interesting thing in the class. So she brought her own knitting needles from Knitter's Pride and uh, I taught her to do the magic loop. It was the first time that she tried the magic loop when she has to like pull up the cord. Like in magic loop, you have to uh, like slide the needle back into some loops and or like pull the needles out of these uh, stitches. Like you have to do that each round for the magic loop and for her it was initially very hard for her to do that and each time some stitches stuck around the needles and I looked at it and I found that it was because of the connector between 
her needle and the cord was there was like a step it was not smooth and i've never had any issue with that uh, because I think the connector for the needles that I own are quite good. They are all like smooth like that. So uh, the brand that she used was Nate Pro. I forgot the line, but anyway, there was like a step. It's, it's even visible, like there is a step between the needle and the cord. And each time that step will catch the stitches. And then she bought the Haya Haya Sharp from the store and the magic loop improved so much for her so just a thing i think to keep in mind that if you are using the magic loop and you're buying some uh, long circular needles for that you might wish to check the connector between needle and cord and so that uh, it have a smooth connection i have used the lucky needle the leaky lucky needles wooden needles and also the higher higher sharp circular needles and i've never experienced any issue like that so you could check out those brands and i've also heard a lot of good things about the chao gu circular needles the cord is even more even smoother than these but it's on the more expensive end and it's would be something nice to try if you had any issue with magic loop so it could not be, it could not be you it could be something problem with the knitting needles and i'm going to talk about some make plans for the next two months and the first thing i have a swatch and can you guess what i'm swatching for <laughs> i am going to knit the fortune sweater by Petit Knit with this yarn is the Kama Rose uh, Midnight Sol. I'll show you the yarn label here. This is a Danish brand, I believe, and it is 84% baby alpaca. 36% tensile and 10% merino and the line name Midnasol is supposed to mean Midnight Sun as I got from Google Translate and my colorway is 9512 uh, this thing I won't pronounce but it means sea grain from Google Translate software. And this is a sample knit for Wet Coast Wools. They are going to attend the Knit City Yarn Festival in Vancouver in September 24 and 25th. And I, and I got this yarn for free, provided that I knit this uh, sweater by the deadline of the Knit City event and then they will be displaying this uh, in the event as well as in their shop later so um, after a couple months of displaying then I will have the knitted sweater back. A couple weeks ago Margot from the store uh, has asked me if I if I would still like to do it with some pattern and we had some discussion on selecting pattern and then I just said this fortune sweater is uh, on my knitting wish list and then uh, she offered this yarn and which which will be a good fit for this project I, I just feel so lucky that I can do that I'm inspired to do this pattern because of two podcasts. One is from Rachel from the Night Sky Knitting. She also knitted uh, this fortune sweater with a color that is kind of similar to this like sage green. And she also used a uh, alpaca, alpaca yarn, uh, but from Dropscar, I think. And and she, Rachel said that she was inspired to do the fortune sweater because of Rudy Miet from a French knitting podcast. And Judy was also knitting a fortune sweater, but in a darker uh, green, like a pine green-ish color. And I think she also did a, like a rusty red-ish color, and which also looked great. 
I think all of their knitting looks probably better than this photo by Petit Knit. So their knitting sold me on this pattern and I, I just decided that I want to knit this sweater. I think in the pattern it is knitted with two strands of silk mohair yarn like from Isabel Gar or Tilia by Ficolana or Teen Silk Mohair by San Nesgar. But I think if uh, your skin doesn't tolerate mohair, you can try this alpaca yarn. And it, this is softer, but also have this halo effect, like silk mohair. And also I think because of, perhaps because of the tensile component in this yarn, there is a thin strand of white along this yarn as well. So maybe you can see it better from my knitted swatch. And it just looks so like gentle and so soft and I've tried it on my skin and I don't have any irritation on my skin. And I do have like very sensitive skin so if I say it feels gentle on my skin, it really does feel gentle on my skin. <laughs> and I, I like the color so much. There was also another like grayer shade of gray in this line of Camaros yarn and I was debating which one I want but anyway I go with the greener grain because um, like more saturation in the color makes me a bit happier and it's also like not too strong of a grain so I think it fits well with my skin tone and I'm going to cast it on tonight hopefully and maybe I'll share my knitting progress with you on my Instagram highlight as well as in my future podcast and uh, if you're interested maybe we could do a knit along this is a great pattern the the sleeves it's, it's like a three-quarter sleeve and uh, and this fabric is just so divine it's so soft so light yeah I think it would be great for autumn knitwear to have. So that's one knit plan and another one is I'm bringing back my fair L vest and uh, I have showed this a couple episodes ago before the summer comes and since the summer I have put that in hibernating uh, but now I think it's going back. I have just knitted like one little motif since I brought it back and I and just one more motif and then I will be knitting those uh, decreases for the armhole and the neckline and by the way this is from and uh, the pattern is from the fair knitting book by uh, Kazekobo or Yukohata the sa same name for the designer and unfortunately, and unfortunately it doesn't have a English version for now so I don't know where you could get that and this is a sticked project so I so I will have to figure out how to do those decreases so that I can prepare for the sticking um, all those techniques are written in the book so I will be doing some learning and uh, do that. You may see that I have the DPNs on the needle right now. I don't regularly use DPNs. I, I have been using the uh, higher higher sharp circular needles but I have to free up that three millimeter circular needle for my fortune sweater. The neckband is knitted with three millimeter needle and then the main body is four millimeter needle. So I just have to free up that three millimeter circular needle for my fortune sweater neckband and after that I can bring back the three millimeter circular needle for my fair L vest. These DPNs are just some bamboo DPN uh, from the <laughs> lab yarn. Uh, when I when I bought those love yarn or hui gui xian and the Chinese yarn, they always just gave me these free DPNs. It's a thing in China. Like, if you buy something from the online store, and if you have if you buy like 
100 yuan or 200 yuan of something, they will give you these some random free gifts. It's it's okay. It's kind of handy to just have a separate set. I just don't want to spend money buying more knitting needles. I'm a very thrift person. <laughs> so that's all my knitting chats. And in my last episode, I have promised that I would answer some of your random questions, knitting or non-knitting related. And I have received a lot of good questions. And today I think I will just answer one question. And in the future, I will be answering more. And if you have more questions for me, you can also use the Ask Me Anything anonymous link uh, in the description below or write this in your comment and th today's question it will be just sort of a personal question rather than a knitting one and if you're here just for the knitting content um, thank you for sticking around with me and I'll see you next time and if you are okay with me talking about my personal thoughts and things experiences I'll be answering this question by PJK. Their question is, what was it like for you when you first came to this country? What was a happy surprise and what was a challenge? Uh, and I think it's a nice question to uh, to answer and to like just chat a little bit about my immigration history. So I come from China. I grew up in Harbin, China, which is in the northeastern part of China, very close to Russia, very cold. And then I uh, moved to Shanghai, China, which is in the southern part, to do my undergrad for four years. And then I did my uh, master's in, uh, in Rhode Island, the United States, for two years. And then I moved to Canada for my PhD, and I've been doing my PhD for five years now, and hopefully to finish soon. But I, uh, I enjoyed my time in Canada here and I'm going to stay here with my husband. My husband is from the same high school as me, so he's from China as well. And we are, I think, and we are going to uh, live in Vancouver for a while since we both enjoy our life here. So to answer this question, I will like combine my experiences in the US as well as in Canada. There are some like similar things, but there are also some different experiences for the two countries. Uh, as a happy surprise, uh, there is one thing that I feel and learned from coming to the North American countries. Like you can make a living with dignity with every profession and you don't have the stress to finding jobs that have like a better reputation. It's something that I learned gradually while I live here is it's not like a one moment surprise. It's like a surprise that came to me over time. Like in China, there is a tendency of people wanting to be um, there's a word in China called 人上人, meaning like people above other people. Like in China, you have this, you sort of have the stress to become the people above people. Like you can only earn your self esteem by like by earning more or having better jobs, having having cars, having larger houses. You don't base your self value on yourself. You're you are constantly under the pressure of being compared to others and your self-value is sort of defined by the comparison with other people. Even in the academia in China, like if you publish more papers, you will be considered the people above people and like people will uh, praise you, but then like in their own mind, they're kind, kind of very jealous and envy what you have but they themselves will be under pressure to become a people above people. I, I, I don't think I have been affected by that mindset very much, but it is still something that could bother me. But when I came to the North America, I just feel people are more relaxed. Like if you are a carpenter and you love what you do and you do your carpenting very well, and you will be respected. And if you're just someone who mows the lawn, and you will be mowing people's lawns, you make a living, you earn enough money for your family. 
and you will be respected for mowing the lawn. And then like people who's like working in an air conditioned, a uh, tall building, wouldn't be like in their mind despising you. But like Chinese people would kind of. Have this mindset that if you are doing those laboring kind of job are worse compared to like the white collared jobs. Although like white collared people aren't <laughs> necessarily earning more money than the blue collared people, but that's what a surprise for me. Well, I I think this. Like striving to be a people above people, this kind of mindset exists in North America as well. Especially now, there are more and more Asian people in North America. So, <laughs> but just like for a general level, there are fewer people that think that way. I don't know if that makes sense to you. I think if you grow up in the Asian culture, you would understand what I mean. So anyway, I think that's something I learned. That's something I'm trying to internalize and to tell myself that I don't necessarily have to work on something that I hate but deemed more reputable by the society. I could do something that I like and be loved and respected, and that is like a valuable and good life for me. And for me personally, that sort of means. If I hate my PhD in mechanical engineering, it would be fine to finish with the PhD and not thinking about mechanical engineering and do some knitting. If I'm very good at knitting and I love knitting, and this would be a satisfying life if I am just going to be knitting from now on. Some people around me would still say, "What a pity that will be." If you learned mechanical engineering for all those years, and you will be throwing that away, and I'm not going to throw that all away. It only means that I am not going to do a job that is strictly mechanical engineering. But all those engineering trainings will still be useful for me for my knitting, like how I engineered all these knit knitwares, and when I'm designing. You know, for a knitwear design, it's kind of like drawing a shape on a mesh, right? And in my, <laughs> in my engineering, like I have to do a lot of simulation, and in fluid mechanics, in the simulation, what we do is like draw a mesh with a lot of like rectangles, and that's the same as a stitch pattern, isn't it? <laughs> and, and I just like draw a shape over、uh, a grid, and then try to run simulations to、uh, mimic some flow structure in reality. And in it, where designed would be like you draw a grid, and then you draw like a tank top shape to fit into a, a real person's body measurements. So isn't that similar thing? So anyway, I think that's a digression from the question. And another part of the question is with the challenge that you have. And I think for me, it was to find my place in this different culture. And I feel that in U.S. it was harder than in Canada. In U.S. there are a lot of immigrants and different cultures around as well. But I think the U.S. culture focuses more on. A medley, like they try to assimilate you to their American values. When I was there, I feel like I was constant, and I was usually asked the question,、uh, "Why do you choose to study here?" And I just feel like they have the expectation of me、uh, writing a two hundred words composition on、uh, why the United States is a great country. I I don't think that's what they expected, but like. I feel that way. Whereas I think in in Canada, I don't have the pressure to fit in their culture. I'm okay just be a like first generation Asian female in、uh, in this society, and I have my own place. And there are so many great Chinese restaurants in Vancouver. Like I don't to I don't need to. Assimilate into Canadian culture. I mean, I can enjoy the Canadian culture. Like the these are very friendly, outdoorsy people. And when I 
get out of a bus, I would say thank you as all the Canadians do and I would hold doors for the next people that come in. But on the other hand, I feel that um, Canadian people are genuinely more interested in my own culture and like they would respect me to honor my own culture and like do my own cultural things and they don't try to like force me to do their cultural things and like I, I, I do some of their cultural things out of my own wish but I just don't feel more pressured to assimilate yeah and that's sort of the reason why after two years staying in America I decided to move to Canada and I'm very satisfied with my decision so far and also like during my two years in America that was when there's a lot of like Asian hate crimes uh, and there was also a lot of issue with my visa like every time the visa officer in America see, uh, saw that I am a PhD in engineering they will immediately spend like over one month to examine my profile to see if I am a, a spy or something and after that uh, they would only issue me a one-year visa so it's not been a pleasant and welcoming experience for me when I was in the United States and I just feel a bit more welcomed in uh, Canada now and I enjoy my time living here so that's my answer to the question and uh, thank you PJ for asking me this. That comes to the end of this episode. Uh, I have to say that I probably won't be able to uh, record this frequently in the next couple months because uh, my thesis is due by end of September so I really had to work very hard on that but I might be like posting a few short and to update you on my progress on my fortune sweater and things and you can also see what I'm doing on my Instagram I'm there as SD underline Athena or if you search Seedling Stitch you should be able to find me I'm also on Ravelry as Athena Liu you can find all my patterns there and my project notes if some of the tips and tricks in my episode were helpful for you please consider support me on Ko-fi you can buy me a coffee on Ko-fi com slash seedling stitch or become a monthly supporter and thank you to all my Kofi supporters your support means a lot to me and it helps to keep this channel going and please like subscribe and make some comments below for this episode so that I can get a bit more reach in the YouTube recommendation algorithm uh, in the end of this episode I am playing a piano piece as always this will also be a song composed by Niels Fram one of my favorite composers the song name is Tristana and I'm also going to put some footage of the firework show a couple weeks ago in Vancouver there have been a firework show featuring shows from different countries and um, and they were they were so beautiful they were great and I just hope you enjoy this little footage and my piano playing and until next time, see you, bye!